Okay, hello everybody. We are recording. I am uh, doing this recorded lecture for chapter 16 um, of our textbook. And so chapter 16, we're talking about um, dilutive uh, or dilutive securities and earnings per share. And so some of this will look familiar to you because we got practice with um, the earnings per share calculations back um, in the chapter that we went over the income statement. Um, it, earnings per share is something that's required um, to be on the income statement, right? Kind of at the bottom um, of the income statement. So. We've gotten practice with this before. Um, now this chapter is introducing us to some new concepts with um, securities, um, dilutive meaning that they would reduce um, earnings per share. And then the chapter also discusses anti-dilutive um, securities that would increase earnings per share. So we're gonna look at some examples and then of course um, get practice in class together. So I am going to share my screen with you and get the PowerPoints pulled up. Okay, so here are the um, chapter 16 PowerPoints. Um, and so uh, again, we're talking about um, dilutive securities and earnings per share. So. Um, some of the major learning objectives of this chapter describe the accounting for the issuance, conversion, and retirement of convertible securities, contrast the accounting for stock warrants and um, for stock warrants issued with other securities. And um, when we get into that, we're going to be looking at like lump sums where we do the proportional method or the incremental method um, that we've talked about before. Describe the accounting and reporting for stock compensation plans, compute basic earnings per share, and then compute diluted earnings per share. All right, so um, debt and equity. And so like we've talked about before, when a company wants to raise a large amount of capital, they can do so by either, or the main two ways that they can do it is, is either by issuing debt securities, which are bonds, for example, that we have to pay back, um, or equity securities like um, stock, uh, preferred stock, common stock, things like that, that they don't um, necessarily have to pay back, right? So um, how these are reported, whether they're reported as liabilities or equity, part of equity is, um, you know, ba based upon what type of securities they are. So um, stock options, convertible securities, preferred stock. Again, those are some of the um, issues that we're going to be looking at and talking about as we continue through the chapter. And so um, just like your um, book tells us um, on whether they're recorded as liability or equity, and this is at... Um, at the top of page 836, companies should classify non-redeemable common shares as equity because the issuer has no obligation to pay dividends or to repurchase the stock. Um, however, um, the types of securities that we report as liabilities, um, it says in our book, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, prohibited equity classification. Most companies classified um, these securities between debt and equity on the balance sheet. So when they there's a group of different types of securities, you know, part of them could be um, considered liabilities, part of them could be considered equity. So again, as we uh, move through the um, chapter and, and look at some examples of these. We'll talk more about that. Okay, so accounting for convertible debt. So convertible bonds are bonds that can be changed into other securities during some specific period of time or um, after, after issuance. So um, convertible bonds, for example, could be converted into preferred stock or they can be converted into common stock, right? So they can be converted into some other type of security. And so just like it shows here, um, the benefit of the bond um, is that bondholders are guaranteed interest and they're guaranteed, um, you know, that, that principal payment when the bond matures. 
um, plus with a convertible bond, and, and this is number two here, um, they get the privilege of exchanging it for stock. So just like it shows here, two main reasons that corporation issue um, convertibles are to raise equity capital without giving up more ownership control um, than necessary and to obtain debt financing at um, cheaper rates. And so, um, you know, ju just like your book tells us, um, you know, convertible bond combines the benefits of the bond with the privilege of exchanging it for um, stock at the holder's option. So not that that option will always be um, recognized or will always be taken, but it, it is there for convertible bondholders. And then some of the accounting issues that we look at um, for accounting for convertible debt involves um, issues uh, for the number one, the issuance of the convertible debt, um, number two, the conversion, and then number three, the retirement of the convertible debt. And so um, some of these that we talk about, um, at the time of issuance, recording convertible bonds follows the method used to record straight debt issues with any discount or premium amortized over the term of the debt. So we've gotten um, some practice with the amortization already and how to record um, you know, bond issuances and things like that. So um, you know, re really nothing new there. Um, at the time of conversion is when um, it, it gets a little bit new for us. And so um, they show us an example, and I think probably on the next slide we'll see an example. They show us an example on page 837 um, of our textbook as well. But at the time of conversion, it says companies use the book value method when converting bonds. When the debt holder converts the debt to equity, so in other words, converts the bonds to stocks, the issuing company recognizes no gain or loss upon conversion. And then finally, with the retirement of convertible debt, it's recognized the same as retiring debt that is not convertible. Um, the difference between the cash acquisition price and the carrying amount should be reported as a gain or loss on the income statement. And again, they show us um, an example of this on page 838 of our textbook. I think probably the next slide might as well, but um, uh, 838 on our textbook also. And so here's our example. It says Miller Corporation issued 4 million par value, 7% convertible bonds at 99 for cash. So remember that at 99 means 99% of their par value or face value. So if we take 4 million times 0.99, we're going to end up bringing in 3,960,000 um, in cash on this issuance. It says if the bonds had not included the conversion feature, they would have sold for 95 or 95% of par value. Record the entry at the date of issuance. Um, so again, just like we've seen before, um, this is nothing new. We've gotten practice with this journal entry before. Um, debiting cash for the amount of cash proceeds, or in this case, as they show it, the issue price. Um, debiting the discount on bonds payable and then crediting um, the bonds payable account. All right, here's another example. It says more corporation has outstanding $2,000, $1,000 bonds. So in other words, 2,000 times 1,000, um, that's about $2 million, right? That's $2 million of outstanding bonds. It says each convertible into 50 shares of $10 par value common stock. The bonds are converted on December 31st, 2017 when the unamortized discount is 30,000 and the market price of the stock is 21 per share. Prepare the entry to record the conversion of bonds. So in this case, as we see, um, since we're converting the bonds into stock, we are debiting bonds payable for the whole 2 million, uh, which is the maturity value or what we would have to pay bondholders um, at, at maturity. So we're debiting bonds payable for the 2 million. We're crediting the discount on bonds payable for that unamortized amount, uh, 30,000. 
Um, we're crediting common stock for the amount of shares um, that are being issued. So uh, 2,000 bonds, each bond was convertible into 50 shares. So 2,000 bonds times 50 shares times that $10 par value um, per share for the common stock. So that's a total credit to common stock of 1 million. And then the difference here is that paid in capital excess of par. All right, here's another example. It says more corporation has outstanding $1,000 face value or par value bonds, each convertible into 50 shares of $10 par value common stock. Assume Moore wanted to reduce its annual interest cost and agreed to pay the bondholders um, $70,000 uh, to convert the bond. So um, in this case, we have to recognize this debt conversion expense. So, um, you know, to convert the bonds into stocks, it's the same journal entry as we see here. But then we have to recognize this additional um, debt conversion expense. So debit to the expense, credit to cash. All right, so convertible preferred stock. So convertible preferred stock includes an option for the holder to convert preferred shares into a fixed number of common shares. Um, in this case, we classify um, these as part of stockholders equity. Um, unless mandatory redemption exists. And uh, just like it tells us in our book, um, there is no theoretical justification for recognizing a gain or loss when exercised. Um, and I was just trying to find exactly here. Um, doo -doo 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 it says a company does not recognize a gain or loss when it deals with stockholders in their capacity as business owners. Therefore, companies do not recognize a gain or loss when stockholders exercise convertible per, uh, preferred stock. That's at the bottom of page 838. All right, so here's our example of that. It says Gall Inc. issued 2,000 shares of $10 par value common stock upon conversion of 1,000 shares of $50 par value preferred stock. The preferred stock was originally issued at $60 per share. The common stock is trading at 26 per share at the time of conversion. Prepare the entry to record the conversion. So, you know, for, first of all, when we issued the preferred stock, we would have credited preferred stock and then we would have credited paid in capital excess of par for the preferred stock, right? So um, since we're now converting these into common stock, we need to zero out uh, both, both of those. So we're debiting preferred stock, 50,000. That's the 1,000 shares times the $50 par value. And then we're debiting paid in capital excess of par for the preferred stock. That's the $1,000 shares um, times the $10 difference between um, what the preferred stock was originally issued at the 60 per share versus the par value 50 per share, right? That $10 difference. And then we're crediting common stock for the par value of the common stock. So um, 2000 shares times $10 and then the difference um, credit to paid in capital excess of par for common stock. All right, stock warrants. So stock warrants, um, our certificates entitling the holder to acquire shares of stock at a certain price within a stated period um, normally un, uh, arises under these three situations. So to make the securities more attractive, um, it's kind of adding uh, your book calls it. Um, I was just trying to find it real quick, like a, a a sweetener or a kicker <laughs> um, to, to make the securities more attractive. Um, existing stockholders have a pre, uh, preemptive right to purchase the common stock first. Um, and, and just like your book tells us on this one, um, existing stockholders have that preemptive right because essentially if we are going to issue more common stock um, that is going to reduce the earnings per share. So 
um, in that case, we give existing stockholders, you know, again, that kind of first um, first dibs, you know, to purchase the common stock. And then also like it shows here, um, number three, uh, two executives and employees as a form of compensation, also called stock options is um, an another term for this. All right, so stock warrants issued with other securities, um, just like it shows here, um, you know, you usually, you know, for example, other securities, say we're issuing um, bonds and then we issue a stock warrant, you know, the stock warrant basically is a long term option to buy common stock at a fixed price. Um, and, and just like it shows here, generally the life of the warrant is five years, sometimes 10 years. And I think we have examples of each of those in our book. Um, proceed, uh, proceeds are allocated between the two securities. Um, allocation is based on fair market values. And then as we've seen with a couple um, of these other types of calculations, there are two methods that we can use to allocate these, either the proportional method, if we know the fair market value of all securities involved in the lump sum, um, or the incremental uh, incremental method, if we know um, maybe only the, the fair market value of one of the securities in, in, the lump, in the lump sum. So we'll see examples of both of these. And these are shown, um, page eight, bottom, bottom of page 840, um, 841, um, and then on to, um, well, yeah, I guess 840, 841. So um, here's an example of the proportional method. It says, determine the value of the bonds without the warrants and the value of the warrants. Um, obviously, as we've seen before, the proportional method allocates the proceeds using the proportion of the two amounts based on their fair value. So Here's our example. It says Mar Golf Corporation issued uh, $1,000 face value bonds at 101. And, you know, again, remember these are premium bonds then um, because they're selling at 101% of their face value, right? It says each bond was issued with one detachable stock warrant. After issue, the bonds were selling in the market at 98 and the warrants had a market value of $40. So to get that um, fair market value to be able to um, calculate the proportions that each one of these, these is worth, right? Each one of these um, securities is worth. So for the bonds, we're taking the number of bonds times the face value per bond, and then we're using that market rate, 98%. So of this, um, you know, lump sum issuance, um, the bonds are um, allocated 1,960,000. And then the warrants, again, there's one stock warrant with each bond. And so 2,000 warrants times that um, market price of $40, market value or market price of $40 per warrant they're going to be allocated 80,000 of this. And so um, again, looking over here at the proportional, we've done this before, the bonds are going to be allocated 96%. The warrants are going to be not, uh, allocated 4% of that. So if we take the um, fair market value times 96%, we're going to allocate uh, $1,940,784 to the bonds. And then taking that same fair market value times 4%, we're gonna allocate 79,216 to the warrants, right? And so when we think about the bond issuance, um, 2 million worth of bonds um, are allocated fair market value of the bonds, $1,940,784. That difference is that discount on the bonds, right? And so looking at those journal entries, um, we'd be looking at um, debiting cash, uh, $2 million, $20, crediting, or excuse me, debiting the discount on bonds payable for the 59216 
crediting bonds payable for two million and then crediting paid in capital on the stock warrants, um, 79,216. So again, we'll get practice with these in class together, but we've gotten some practice already um, with the proportional method on different um, assets and, and things that we've practiced. All right, it's, it's, uh, this one says, assume each, ooh, hot dog. Ah, shoot, where am I going? Oopsie, okay, sorry. <laughs> getting, uh, getting clicker happy on this thing. So it says, assume each warrant can be exercised to buy one share of common stock, a $5 par value of Margolf Inc. for 30 per share. If investors exercise all 2,000 warrants, one warrant per one share of stock, Margolf Inc. makes the following entry. So um, if they exercise all 2,000 warrants at $30 per share, we're going to be debiting cash for $60,000. And then remember on the previous um, entry, we credited paid in capital for the stock warrants. So now that, um, now that the uh, investors have in fact taken advantage of these warrants, we're debiting paid in capital on the stock warrants. Um, uh, 79,216. We're crediting common stock again for the amount of uh, shares, 2,000 times that par value per share. So we're crediting common stock for 10,000. And then we're going to credit paid in capital excess of par for that difference um, to common stock. All right. The incremental method, again, the incremental method is used when a company cannot determine the fair value of either the warrants or the bonds. And so in this case, we use the security um, for which the fair value can be determined. And then we just calculate the difference. Um, again, it shows us this on the bottom of page 841. Um, so, you know, for, for example, if we've got a lump sum issuance of 10 million, and we can only value the stock warrants uh, for 300,000, then we're gonna allocate 9.7 million to, to the bonds is what the example shows us in your textbook. So here is that, um, you, you know, using the McCarthy. So uh, again, McCarthy Inc. issued 2,000, uh, $1,000 face value bonds at 101. Each bond was issued with one detachable stock warrant. After issuance, the bonds were selling in the market at 98 or 98% of their face value. Market price of the warrants without the bonds cannot be determined. Use the incremental method to record issuance of the bonds and warrants. So again, on this, on this example, you know, on the example they show us in your book on the bottom of page 841, um, we know the value of the warrants, and so we allocate the remaining part to the bonds. Um, in, in this case, we know the value of the bonds, so we're going to allocate the remaining part um, to the warrants. And so just like we saw with the proportional method, we take the 2,000 um, number of bonds, right? So the 2,000 bonds times the face value per bond times 98%, that gives us that 1,960,000. Um, and, and again, we do not know the value of the warrants, right? So um, if we've got an issue price of, you know, 2 million, 20,000, um, the bonds are going to be allocated 1 million, 960,000, then we're going to allocate the warrants um, 60,000, right? So the, the face value of the bonds, 2 million, um, the allocated fair market value, 1960000 that may, that gives us a discount of 40000 And so like we see here, um, we're going to have the debit to cash, and that would be the 2,000 bonds uh, times the face value per bond times 101%, uh, right? So we're going to have the debit to cash. We're going to have the debit to the discount on bonds payable. Um, that's the difference between the face value of the bond and the amount that um, has been allocated for the fair market value. We're going to credit bonds payable for the 2 million and then credit 
paid in capital for the stock warrants um, for 60,000. All right, so stock warrants, um, you know, ju just like your book tells us, um, you know, there, there are several different types of stock warrants. So detachable warrants um, are ba basically um, can be detached from the original security. So um, detachable warrants involve at least two securities, a debt security like a bond, and then a warrant to purchase a common stock. Um, and if they are um, detachable, then that, you know, that just means, and, and just like, and this is on the page of eight, uh, top of page 842 in, in your book. Um, let's see here. I was just looking. Okay, so, um, so Financial Accounting Standards Board indicated that the issuance of bonds with detachable warrants involves two securities, one, a debt security, which will may, remain outstanding until maturity, and the other, a warrant to purchase common stock. Um, at the time of issuance, separable instruments exist. Um, the existence of two instruments therefore justifies separate treatment. So um, that's with detachable warrants. Again, uh, uh, underneath here, we see non-detachable warrants. So non-detachable warrants do not require an allocation of the proceeds between the bonds and the warrants. Um, detachable warrants, um, or excuse me, non-detachable warrants. Um, it, it says in our book, similar to the accounting for convertible bonds, companies record the entire proceeds from non-detachable warrants as debt. Um, and then uh, stock right slash um, that pre-existing or that preemptive privilege, the right to purchase newly issued shares in proportion to their holdings. Um, you know, just like it shows here. Um, and I was trying to find it. It's about mid, you know, uh, upper to midway down on page 842, you know, just, just like it tells us in the book, you know, this is because if we are issuing additional shares, that is going to reduce our earnings per share or dilute our earnings per share. And so existing stockholders um, have the right to, um, to purchase newly issued shares first, basically, right? So price is normally less than the current price of the shares. Um, and companies only make a memorandum entry. It says companies make only a memorandum entry when they issue rights to existing stockholders. This entry indicates the number of rights issued to existing stockholders in order to ensure that the company has additional unissued stock registered for issuance in case the rights are exercised. So basically, a memorandum entry to keep some stocks aside for current shareholders um, that, that would like to exercise the right to purchase more. All right, stock compensation plans, otherwise known as stock options, give uh, key employees option to purchase common stock at a given price over extended period of time. Effective compensation programs are ones that, um, number one, base compensation on performance, number two, motivate employees, number three, help retain executives and recruit new talent, um, number four, maximize employees after tax benefit, and then number five, use performance criteria over which employee has control. Um, and, and it discusses this more um, on page 843 and then shows um, you know, so, some of the different companies, uh, Disney, Ford, Urban Outfitters, Walmart stores that offer these types of options um, to, their, uh, to their employees. All right, so here's um, what, what they're showing us on the, on the bottom of page 843. It says, illustration 16-3 indicates that option expense is a much smaller element of compensation relative to restricted stock at companies such as Ford and Walmart stores. Um, so they're kind of showing us the difference here between option grants versus restricted stock grants. Um, 
Many companies decided to cut back on the issuance of stock options, both to avoid such accounting manipulations and to heed off investor doubts. Um, in addition, GAAP now um, requires that results in companies recording at higher expense when stock options are granted. So again, it talks about that um, on the bottom of page 843 in your textbook. All right, so measurement of stock compensation. It says GAAP requires companies to recognize compensation costs using the fair value method. Under the fair value method, companies use acceptable option pricing models to value the options at the date of the grant. And so um, we're talking about this between eight, page 844, page 845. So the recognition uh, of the stock compensation, two main accounting issues. So how to determine compensation expense and then over what periods to allocate compensation expense. So determining compensation expense, it says compensation expense based on the fair value of the options expected to vest on the date they grant the options to the employees. So the grant date and then allocating the compensation expense recognizes compensation expense in the periods in which employees perform the service. Um, and so it talks about two different uh, methods. Actually, it talks about um, the intrinsic value method, uh, which is um, one approach that measures compensation costs by the excess of the market price of the stock over its exercise price at the grant date. And then, of course, the other, um, the fair value method. And, and like we said, GAAP does require um, that fair value method. And so here's an example of this. It says, on November 1, 2016, the stockholders of Searly Company approve a plan that grants the company's five executive options, five executives options to purchase 2,000 shares each or a total of 10,000 shares, right? Five executives times 2,000 shares each, right? Uh, of the company's $1 par value common stock. The company grants the options on January 1, 2017. The executives may exercise the options at any time within the next 10 years. The option price per share is $60 and the market price of the shares at the date of the grant is 70 uh, per share. So under the fair value method, the company computes total compensation expense um, by applying an acceptable fair value option pricing model. The fair value option pricing model determines Surly's total compensation expense to be 220,000, all right? So if we're looking at this um, and what our entries would look like, it says, assume that the expected period of benefit is two years starting with the grant date. Surly would record the transactions related to this option contract as follows. So um, the first year we would debit compensation expense for half of it, credit paid in capital stock options. And then the second year, again, we would debit compensation expense um, for the remaining half and then credit um, paid in capital um, for these stock options, 110,000. So now if Searley's executives exercise 2,000 of the 10,000 options or 20% of the options on June 1, 2020, three years and five months after the date of grant, the company records the following journal entry. So we would um, debit cash for uh, the amount of cash being brought in on the option 2000 times 60. We would debit paid in capital um, stock options for 44,000. Uh, um, credit common stock, uh, 2000 shares times a dollar per share and then credit that paid in capital excess of par. Um, and so, you know, again, 20%, if we look at 220,000 times 0.2, that's our 44,000 um, paid in capital, um, you know, that, that we're debiting since, since in fact, 20% of these stock options are being exercised. 
And then expiration, if Sarely's executives fail to exercise the remaining 80%, the remaining stock options before their expiration date, the company records the following at the date of expiration. Um, so again, we, oh, hot dog. We debit paid in capital um, for the remaining 80% um, of stock options. So debit paid in capital stock options credit paid in capital expired stock options. Um, it, it shows us these entries, but basically bottom of page 846, um, top of page 847. Um, it says an unexercised stock option does not nullify the need to record the cost of services received from executives and attributable to the stock option plan. Under GAAP, the a company therefore does not adjust compensation expense upon expiration of the option. So um, as we'll see, um, as we go through and get practice with these and, and continue through the PowerPoint slide. So if the stock options just expire, we do not have to adjust compensation expense. However, if an employee forfeits the stock options because they leave the company before they're vested, for example, uh, the company should adjust the estimate of compensation expense recorded in the current period as a change in estimate. Um, it says a company records this change in estimate by debiting paid in capital stock options and crediting compensation expense for the amount of cumulative compensation expense recorded to date. All right, so restricted stock plans. So restricted stock plans transfer shares of stocks to employees subject to an agreement that the shares cannot be sold, transferred, transferred or pledged until vesting occurs. So, you know, companies have different vesting periods. I know at the, um, the last position I held as, um, a full service accountant, that company, the National Association of Edu uh, Electri uh, Electrical Distributors, <laughs> um, the vesting period was, was three years. Um, I know at some companies, the vesting period is five years, but, but basically that means you have to work there for three years or for five years until you're completely vested, right? So um, just like it shows here, the major advantages of restricted stock is that it never becomes completely worthless. Um, number two generally results in less dilution to existing stockholders. And then three, it better aligns employee incentives with company incentives. And again, it talks about this more on the bottom of page 847. And so here's our example. It says on January 1, 2017, Skidmore Company issues 1,000 shares of restricted stock to its CEO, Rail Stalker. <laughs> Skidmore's stock has a fair value of 20 per share on January 1, 2017. Additional information is as follows. So number one, the service period related to the restricted stock is five years. Uh, number two, vesting occurs if stalker stays with the company for a five-year period. Number three, the par value of the stock is a dollar per share. So um, Skidmore makes the following entry on the grant date. So um, looking here, uh, we're debiting unearned compensation uh, for $20,000. Um, and, and again, if we go back real quick here, hot dog. Um, this is the 1,000 shares times the $20 fair value per share, right? So we're, we're debiting unearned compensation for 20,000. Just like it tells us in our book, and this is about halfway down page 848, um, unearned compensation is a contra equity account. So it reduces stockholder equity. So remember, equity overall increases with a credit, right? And so because we're debiting unearned compensation, again, that's reducing um, equity. Um, unearned compensation represents the cost of services yet to be performed. Um, the company reports unearned compensation and stockholders equity in the balance sheet as a contra equity account. 
similar to the reporting of treasury stock, right? Just like treasury stock reduces um, stockholder equity. So we're debiting unearned compensation. We're crediting common stock for the $1 um, par value per share. And then we're crediting paid in capital excess of par for um, the difference between the par value per share and the fair um, market value per share. Um, and I know I just read you this part out of the textbook actually. So again, this is um, mid midway page 848, unearned compensation represents the cost of services yet to be performed. Unearned compensation is reported as a component of stockholders equity, um, which it's a contra equity account on the balance sheet. All right, so uh, the next two examples, it says record the journal entry at December 31st, 2017. Um, Skidmore records as compensation expense. So remember, we recorded it as unearned compensation expense, right? We debited unearned compensation expense. Now, and, and the vesting period is five years. So now the employee's been there for an entire year. And so now 20% of that has been earned. So 20% of it, we are debiting compensation expense, crediting unearned compensation expense is what that one would look like, right? Debit uh, compensation expense, 4,000 credit, unearned compensation, 4,000. And then uh, the next example says, assume that stalker leaves on February 3rd, 2019 before any expense has been recorded during 2019. Um, th this is also before, but basically before the, the employee is vested as well. So um, the entry to record this forfeiture is as follows. So debit common stock um, for the amount um, par value per share for the amount of shares, 1,000 shares times that $1,000, or uh, excuse me, 1,000 shares times that dollar par value per share. Um, credit paid in capital excess of par. Again, this is for that 1,000 shares um, times $19, basically the difference between the fair market value per share and the par value per share. Um, credit compensation expense for the amount of compensation expense that has been um, claimed up to that point, and then credit unearned compensation for um, the amount that was not earned up to that point, right? The employee only stayed two years, so we only, uh, we only claim that compensation expense for two years. Um, the remaining three years, the 12,000 unearned compensation, um, then we're closing that out or zeroing that account out. All right, um, stock option plans. So employee stock purchase plans uh, generally permit all employees to purchase stock at a discounted price for a um, short period of time. And just like it tells us um, that these employee stock um, plans are often used by companies to secure equity capital or to induce widespread ownership of its common stock among employees. Um, these plans are considered compensatory, in, in other words, part of compensation unless they satisfy um, three conditions. So number one, substantially all full-time employees may participate on an equitable basis. Uh, number two, the discount from market is small. And I think the small part of that means 5% or less. Um, and then number three, the plan offers no substantive option feature. Uh, disclosure of the compensation plans. This is on the bottom of page 849. So company with one or more share based um, payment arrangements must disclose the nature and extent of such arrangements, the effect on the income statement of compensation cost, um, the method of estimating the fair value of goods and services received, or the fair value of the equity instruments granted. And then for the cash flow effects. 
And they show us an example of this disclosure on page 850. Uh, it, it's a pretty, uh, pretty long disclosure, but they break it down for you on page 850 into, you know, for, for example, again, the description of the plan, the valuation model used, um, the option plan activity and balances, the option expense, and then the restricted plan details. So very detailed disclosure that they show you there on page 850. Um, and, and, and finally, earnings per share. So, you know, again, we've gotten practice with earnings per share before. Um, back in chapter, what was it? I like to think I remember what each chapter talked about, um, but this was back in chapter four. We got practice with earnings per share when we looked at the multi-step income statement. And, and so just like it shows here, and, and this should be kind of a reminder for us, earnings per share indicates the income earned by each share of common stock. Um, companies report earnings per share only for common stock. And so if we remember that formula um, for earnings per share, net income minus preferred dividends divided by weighted average shares outstanding. So we're only reporting earnings per share for common stock because we're subtracting out any preferred dividends if applicable. And then like it says here, when the income statement contains intermediate components such as discontinued operations, companies should disclose earnings per share for each component. So, um, you know, again, we got some practice with this in chapter four. Um, you know, we look at, for example, earnings per share from continuing operations, uh, earnings per share from discontinued operations, and then earnings per share based on net income overall. All right, so earnings per share based on a simple structure uh, or a complex structure. So just like your book tells us, um, this is bottom of page 851. The simple structure consists of only common stock or includes no potential common stock that upon conversion or exercise could dilute earnings per share. Um, a complex structure, uh, capital structure is complex if it includes securities that could have a dilutive effect on earnings per share. In other, in other words, reduce earnings per share, right? So dilutive meaning the ability to influence the earnings per share in a downward direction. And so as we're going to see on, on this and as we continue through the PowerPoints and continue through the chapter, if we, if we have a complex structure that could potentially dilute our earnings per share, then we have to disclose not only earnings per share, but we have to disclose dilutive earnings per share. And so that's what we're gonna kind of see as we continue through this and um, work some of these exercises out of the end of our chapter. All right, so um, basic earnings per share. So uh, this is that formula. Remember we subtract preferred dividends. It says subtract the current year preferred stock dividends from net income to arrive at income available to common stockholders. Um, and, and, and just like it shows here, preferred dividends are subtracted on cu uh, cumulative preferred stock, whether they're declared or not, because Remember, with cumulative preferred stock, the dividends accumulate even if um, like dividends were not paid that particular year, then those dividends accumulate into an account until they're paid. So when the company decides to you know, pay the dividends, they have to pay back not only current um, you know, di dividends declared, but then also any dividends in arrears or dividends that didn't get paid previously, right? So um, that's one of the advantages of owning preferred stock, right? Is that preferred stock dividends get paid before common stockholders are eligible to get any of those dividends. And then to calculate that weighted average number of shares, we're going to look at um, and, and this is similar, these calculations we'll see, I think on the next slide or within the next couple slides, we'll see that these calculations are similar to how we calculated um, weighted average accumulated expenditures when we were looking at um, allocating and capitalizing interest costs. We look at 
um, the, the proportion or the fraction of the year in which the shares were outstanding, right? So um, ju just like it shows here, weighted average number of shares outstanding, companies must weight the shares by the fraction of the period. Um, they are outstanding. When stock dividends or share splits occur, companies need to restate the shares outstanding before the share dividend or split. And so we see, oh, hot dog. We see this example here, um, compute the weighted average number of shares outstanding for Zach Smith Company. And so it's showing us we've got this beginning balance of 90,000 shares. Then on April 1st, we issue 30,000 shares for cash. Um, that takes us up to 120,000 shares. Then on July 1, we purchased back 39,000 shares. So that takes us down to 81 shares outstanding. And then on November 1, we issue 60,000 shares um, for cash. And so that gives us another 60, <clears throat> excuse me, 60,000 shares outstanding, which of course, December 31 ending balance is 141,000 shares outstanding. Again, all 141,000 shares were not outstanding the entire year. So we have to calculate the weighted average number of shares outstanding. And so we look at, you know, for, for example, this 90,000, that was only outstanding um, for January, February, and March, right? So three out of 12 months. And then once we issued these 30,000 shares, right, then, then that changed. So we got to look at, you know, the fraction of each of these basically. So here it shows us a, an example of that. So again, the 90,000, they were only outstanding January, February, March. So three out of 12 months. And then we had the 90,000 plus 30, we had 120,000 from April to July. So April, May, June. So then we had 120,000 shares outstanding for three out of 12 months. And then we purchased back the 39,000, that took us down to 81. We did that July 1st. So then we had 81,000 shares outstanding July, August, September, October for four out of 12 months. And then once we issued these additional 60,000 shares, we had then 141,000 outstanding November and December or two out of 12 months. So of these 141,000 shares outstanding, the weighted average number of shares outstanding is 103,000. So the 103,000 is what we would use for our earnings per share um, calculation. That's our denominator, right? On our earnings per share calculation. Uh, complex capital structures. Again, complex capital structures exist when a business has convertible securities, um, or options, warrants, or other rights uh, available that upon conversion or exercise could dilute earnings per share. Um, company generally reports both basic and diluted earnings per share. And so as we're going to see, and it talks about this more on page, where it be, where it be, um, and it shows us actually the formula on the bottom of page um, 855 is that what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with basic earnings per share. And then from there to get diluted earnings per share, we subtract the impact of convertibles, we subtract the impact of options, warrants and other dilutive uh, securities is, is that formula, right? Here we go. This is what they show us on the bottom of page 855. So. Diluted earnings per share includes the effect of all potential dilutive common shares that were outstanding during the period. Companies will not report diluted earnings per share if the securities in their capital structure are anti-dilutive. In other words, to dilute means to lessen, right? Lessen earnings per share. So anti-dilutive would increase earnings per share. All right, so diluted earnings per share uh, for convertible securities. It says measure the dilutive effects of potential conversion on earnings per share using the if converted method. So um, there's the if converted method and then there's the treasury um, stock method that's used for option and warrant. So we'll look at 
examples of both of these, but it says this method for a convertible bond assumes number one, the conversion at the beginning of the period or at the time of issuance of the security if issued during the period and two, the elimination of related interest net of tax. And so here's our example of that. It says Mayfield Corporation has net income of 210,000 um, for the year and a weighted average number of common shares outstanding during the period of 1,000 shares, or excuse me, 100,000 shares. So again, that basic earnings per share, we would take net income divided by weighted average shares. Basic earnings per share would be uh, $2.10 per share, right? It says the company has two convertible um, debenture bond issues outstanding. One is a 6% issue sold at 100, uh, totaling $1 million in a prior year and convertible into 20,000 common shares. Interest expense on the 6% convertible is 60,000. Again, that's the 1 million times 6%, right? The other is a 10% issue sold at 100, uh, total 1 million on April 1 of the current year and convertible into 32,000 common shares. Interest expense, I just noticed um, that the book has that spelled wrong, but that's okay. I'm not gonna fix it in the middle of the PowerPoint presentation, but interest expense on the 10% convertible bond is 75,000. Um, you know, again, if we took um, 10% times the 1 million, that would give us 100,000. But remember this was, um, these were sold on April 1. So only nine out of 12 months um, would we be, would we incur interest expense that year? So 75,000. Uh, the tax rate is 40%. Calculate basic earnings per share. Again, net income um, divided by those weighted average shares outstanding would give us $2.10 earnings per share. But now when we look at the um, different, um, you know, the, the different um, convertible securities uh, ca calculated in with this, right? We look at, uh, okay, so weighted average number of shares outstanding 100,000. And then we have to add back in basically um, the interest that we will not incur, right? So um, 6% um, as of beginning of the year, we're gonna add back in that 20,000, 10% um, that are available. And, and again, that, you know, 32,000 are available with these um, convertible securities but it's only nine out of 12 months, right? So uh, 24,000 additional. So then we're gonna use um, weighted average number of shares adjusted for diluted securities, 144,000. And so, you know, to calculate this, then we're looking at, okay, our basic net income for earnings per share, our basic weighted average for earnings per share. And then we're gonna add in that interest expense that we're not going to incur. Since these bonds are gonna be converted into stocks, we're not gonna have that $60,000 worth of interest expense. And we take that number less the 40% tax uh, rate, right? And so basically um, we're looking at what? Um, one minus 0 0.4, 0 0.6 times 60%. Um, so 36,000 uh, essentially is what we're going to save on interest by, um, by converting these into shares, right? But then that'll include another 20,000 of shares in, in that denominator. And then the 10% um, debentures on this one, uh, again, we've got to take out that 40% tax rate, but it's only nine out of 12 months. Um, so instead of the entire 75,000, um, we would take 75,000 times 0. 0.6. Um, so so 45,000 essentially would be added to that numerator. And then the extra 24,000 shares added to the, the denominator. And so that 
diluted earnings per share then goes from the basic earnings per share, $2.10, to now this diluted earnings per share, um, $2.02 per share. So uh, again, just like your book tells us, when a company has a complex capital structure like this that includes convertible securities, they are required to not only disclose the basic earnings per share, but this diluted earnings per share as well. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. <laughs> diluted earnings per share options and warrants. So measure the dilutive effects of potential conversion using the treasury stock method. So with the treasury stock method, um, this method assumes number one, the exercise of the option or warrants at the beginning of the year. And number two, that the company uses those proceeds to purchase common stock for treasury. So what we're gonna see on this one is that um, it's going to reduce our denominator by the amount of treasury stock um, purchase. So, so when, we, um, when we use the treasury stock method, um, we don't add the amount of, um, let, let, let me figure out how to word this. Okay, so we don't add um, the, the entire amount of conversion stocks, right? So, um, you know, for, for example, if we were um, going to convert, um, you know, bonds into, you know, 20,000 common stock, well, um, the amount of cash being brought in on the conversion we're going to use to purchase treasury stock. So we're not going to have to add the entire 20,000 to our denominator um, to, to that will dilute or reduce that earnings per share. Um, you know, again, we'll get practice with this in class together. So if I'm not explaining it that well, um, if it doesn't make 100% sense from the PowerPoints, you know, we will get, get practice with it in class together. Um, here's an example of that. So it says Zambrano uh, company's net income for 2017 is 40,000. The only potentially dilutive securities outstanding were 1,000 options issued during 2016, each exercisable for one share at $8. None has been exercised and 10,000 shares of common stock outstanding uh, were outstanding during 2017. The average market price of the stock during 2017 was uh, $20. So um, compute diluted earnings per share and then B, assume that the 1,000 options were issued on October 1, 2017. The average market price during the last three months of 2017 was $20. So remember, to compute diluted earnings per share, we've got to start with basic earnings per share, right? Um, and you'll see here, so the treasury stock methods uh, proceeds if shares are issued, 1,000 shares times $8. And so $8,000 in cash, basically. And then we would turn around and we would spend that $8,000 on treasury stock, basically on purchasing back our, our common stock. So um, purchase price for treasury shares is $20 per share. So then uh, uh, presumably we would purchase 400 shares back. So even though we are issuing a thousand common shares on this, um, on this option, we're going to purchase back 400. So then it's only going to increase our shares um, by that 600 uh, increment. So when we're looking at diluted earnings per share, again, we start hot dog with basic earnings per share first, right? And so we're looking at basic earnings per share, 40,000 divided by 10,000 shares. And then on the um, options, again, it's only increasing that uh, denominator by 600. So then we end up with 40,000 divided by 10,600. And so that gives us diluted earnings per share of $3.77. 
All right, and then we see here, uh, so compute diluted earnings per share, assuming that the 1,000 options were issued on October 1st, 2017. So um, in, in this case, because we didn't have the full, you know, amount outstanding the entire year, we don't have to use the, the 600 share increase. We only need to use, uh, you know, ba basically three out of 12 months of that or 25% of that, right? So then the weighted incremental share increase is only $150. And then so we see here that would only take our diluted earnings per share down to $3.94. We're not adding the whole 600 um, shares into that denominator, only the 25% of that since they were issued on October 1, 2017. All right, so um, earnings per share presentation and disclosure. So as we've talked about before, and they go into this more um, page 860, page 861, a company should show per share amounts for income from continuing operations, um, income before um, extraordinary items, um, you know, discontinued operations, things like that, and then also net income. Per share amounts for discontinued operations or an extra, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary item should be presented on the face of the income statement or in the notes. Um, when, and it says this at the top of page 861. So when a company restates results of operations of a prior period as a result of an error or a change in an accounting principle, it should also restate the earnings per share data shown for the prior periods. Um, Complex capital structures and dual presentation of earnings per share require the following additional disclosures in note form. And so here are those additional um, disclosures that they discuss. So description of the pertinent rights and privileges of the various securities outstanding. Um, number two, a reconciliation of the numerators and denominators denominators of the basic and diluted per share computations, including individual income and share amount effects of all securities that affect earnings per share. Number three, the effect given preferred dividends in determining income available to common stockholders in computing basic earnings per share. Number four, securities that could potentially dilute basic earnings per share in the future that were excluded in the computation because they would be anti-dilutive. And then number five, the effects of conversion subsequent to year end, but before issuing um, this, the financial statement. So um, it, it gives us the... Um, example in your book of, of how both of these should look and kind of the flow chart. Um, and this is page 862, 863. So a simple capital structure. Um, we're just only calculating earnings per share, not dilutive earnings per share. So we compute income applicable to common stockholders. This is the net income minus preferred dividends. We compute weighted average number of common shares outstanding. And from there, we can plug our numbers in to calculate earnings per share. However, when it is a complex capital uh, structure, um, we have to first calculate earnings per share, basic earnings per share, right? And, and remember that formula, um, net income minus preferred dividends, that gives us the numerator, the income applicable to common stockholders divided by the weighted average number of shares outstanding. So then from there, we can include any information that will dilute our earnings per share. You know, all potentially dilutive securities. Um, and so this takes, and I'm going back to the page real quick, um, back on page 855, um, uh, dilutive impact of convertibles, the dilutive impact of stock options, stock warrants, or other dilutive um, securities. 
um, contingent issuance agreements, um, if any. And so then our formula changes to the income applicable to common stockholders adjusted for interest net of tax and preferred dividends on all dilutive shares divided by the weighted average number of shares assuming maximum dilution from all dilutive securities. It's a little bit more complicated in a complex capital structure. So anyway, I look forward to going over these with you guys in class. Hi there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, when we are um, back in class together, we will get practice with um, these calculations and these journal entries. And as always, once you guys have a chance to read this chapter or view this recorded lecture, just let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.